Good afternoon. My name is Evan Morikawa, and this is Desktop JS. So JavaScript is on the desktop, and that transition is well underway. You likely already use an application powered by JavaScript, written by JavaScript developers. And many more are joining this fray every day. Um, at the end of the day, JavaScript is, is being able to power these types of applications, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about why it matters that we in this room care about the desktop at all, show you a little bit, little bit about how the internals of this work, and then so, show you some of the very cool things you can do in this pretty unique development environment. So first of all, we are in this room, we, we write apps on Chrome, which kind of is on the desktop. So what are we talking about desktop apps for? So first of all, when I refer to desktop, I'm talking about that place with a 30-inch monitor, a keyboard, an input form at 60 words per minute um, or faster. But crucially, it is still overwhelmingly the place where real work gets done. It's where people spend 10 hours a day in front of a computer doing work, and it has been drastically underserved for the past several years by especially uh, this market. Um, and it's more than just putting something on a website, because there is something to be said about a type of first-class application that people expect and see on the desktop. There are different expectations about how well it works offline. There are different expectations about performance, about how you can have it open and be in it all day long. Uh, it's why we've been pushing for the desktop. It's why Slack has a desktop app, why Atom was built on the desktop, why Visual Studio Code is built on the desktop. Um, it's a very powerful environment beyond just the, the location that it gives you in the work ethos of somebody of these huge set of users uh, that have historically not been gotten the benefits of the tooling and the creativity of this industry, uh, which leads me to sort of take a step back and look at where we got there when we think about desktop software. Uh, desktop software is pretty old. I mean, it's been there as long as the personal computer, uh, but traditionally the ways in which you build applications have not been particularly friendly to this audience, which is partly why uh, you're here. These technologies are very powerful. Uh, it enables very low-level control of your system but when your goal is to just ship features people want to use, uh, these tend to get in the way, which is why we love a lot of the types of development environments that we have in the modern JavaScript world. On top of that, most of these platforms only work on one platform, which for most people tends to be the development one. Uh, it turns out a huge chunk of the world is in fact still using Windows all day long. And being able to build applications that they can benefit from is extremely valuable, especially in a business context. Nonetheless, the dream of the web on the desktop has uh, been musing around for quite some time now. Node WebKit is a project that's been out for several years uh, that basically, at the, at the end of the day, took a web page and drops it in a frame. Uh, it was a very good first start to show that you could take a web technology and ship it like a desktop app but still has a lot of limitations to what you can do. Uh, we tended to see a lot of these applications very much looked like web pages in a frame and lacked a lot of the subtleties that really made it feel like a desktop application. It created this uncanny valley uh, that's been very difficult until recently to cross. Uh, as a result, about two years ago, the GitHub uh, and the Atom team actually took one of the original contributors of Node WebKit, ZC, Ben, Cheng Zhao, and created the Atom text editor, uh, and as a result, powered it by a framework that they use called Atom Shell. They wanted a first-class desktop-based code editor that was hackable to its core in modern web technology, but to move that forward, they needed to push the state of these web wrappers up a notch. Uh, and that was the birth of Atom Shell, which in April of last year was renamed to Electron. And Electron is the core of what makes all of this possible. It is an open source project that powers much of the desktop applications that hopefully you will increasingly see more of. 
um, and is extremely friendly and fun to get started for this community, which is partly why I'm really excited to show you some of the things you can do with it. At the end of the day, Electron is actually just Chrome uh, and Node. The latest version of Electron has bundled in it Chromium 50 and Node 6, which comes with all the benefits and things you can do in them. Uh, and it means you can start to build applications uh, that run on the desktop. So this is the app that I've been working on, which is called N1. It's an open source email client, uh, and, it, and it provides a lot of the basic pieces you'd expect an email client that can archive and to snooze things can do. But this is an Electron app, which means that it's all web technology under the hood. Everything that you see here is all HTML and CSS. Specifically, we render it uh, with React. Uh, and it has all the, all the access that you'd expect from the regular Chrome console. Uh, but what Electron has done is they've also injected the Node.js runtime directly into each and every render process, uh, which means you can, from right here, require the file system with a native node require. You have access to full node process control as well, which lets you do increasingly more powerful things plus additional APIs that Electron has put on top of this as well. Um, show you shortly a little bit more of the types of things you can do with it, but to get a better appreciation for, for how all of this fits together, I want to talk a little bit more about how Electron as a platform works. Uh, to start us off, though, we need to understand Chromium, the browser you probably are all familiar with every day. When you boot Chromium, the very first thing that happens is you get this browser, this backend process, uh, this main process, they call it. And that's this huge glob of C++ code. It is not particularly friendly for developers to work on. And a Node WebKit was a particular issue if you wanted to do more sophisticated things on top of that. That backend browser process boots up individual render windows. You know them uh, more colloquially as your Chrome tabs. Uh, your entire world before today was just in one of these green boxes. Uh, but in that is the entire DOM, it's the basic JavaScript environment. Um, and under the hood, Chrome shuttles the data back and forth through just a process IPC connection. So what Electron does is that it replaces this, this backend process with Node, and it injects Node into each of the renderer processes as well. Uh, and you can subsequently still use all the communication uh, between all these different processes to do some very sophisticated things with your application. To make that concrete with, like, say, how you just saw the email client boot up, uh, we have a single entry point, a main.js, that's inside of this backend process. Um, and from that, we have an Electron specific API. Electron provides an object called a browser window. And when you say new and call and load a URL from it, which in our case is just from the file system, it starts one of those renderer processes. Um, and then from there, you can actually take it from there. Uh, everything you saw did in fact start from a single index.html that had a single index.js that subsequently continued to load the rest of the page, start up uh, rendering React components and everything else like that as uh, from, from, from then on. But since you also have your code in this backend process, that also means you have the capacity to launch other windows as well. And the power to do this uh, has a lot of very nice features to it. We use it for to launch up extra additional composers that you might want to type in an email client for. And we also use it for this work window concept uh, that I'll show later. Um, and as a result, when you put this all together, you create and you boot up an app with Chrome and Node with just basic web technology. Uh, now, there are a whole bunch of things that you can do on top of this uh, that I want to go over now, specifically uh, four of them, because there, there are tons, but far too many for this time slot. Uh, the first one I want to focus on that's, that's unique to Electron is about this truly native feeling experience you can get. Uh, it's about being able to sort of cross this uncanny valley <laughs> of feeling like you're just looking at a web page, and Electron provides a lot of niceties to build on top of that. So, for example, one of the things that Electron adds is a specific set of APIs for each OS 
to do things like uh, native notifications. Um, so you can, oh actually, show it up in this, but I have this do not disturb on, um, and it pulls it up in the nat as a native Mac notification that I can click, I can load up the app, I can take you to the thread. Um, and w a lot of the work that they've done is then subsequently make sure that that notification system works on Windows as well. On Windows, you get, a, you get a box on the bottom right, you have it in a separate notification system. Uh, it, it means you can add these little tray icons here. Um, this is yet another Electron API that lets you put apps up here as well. We use it to launch new messages. Uh, I've seen a lot of Electron apps that are actually nothing but one of these little tray icons with maybe a little bit of interface on top of it as well. Uh, it also means that you, <coughs> you have the access to control all of your basic window management, spawn them, move them around. Uh, having native windows is actually quite nice uh, because it falls back to the native window management behaviors people are used to, uh, which frankly on Windows is a lot better than it is on Mac right now. Uh, but nonetheless, like the, the, it stays in, in the same vein of the workflows that people are used to with desktop apps. Uh, the other big piece about feeling native, at the end of the day, comes down to the look and feel. Uh, and this is not something that Electron uh, specifically provides for you, uh, but something that we personally take a lot of effort to make sure that on Mac we get the gradients of the title bars just right, um, that the stoplights work fine. And there actually are, are a lot of projects out there now that provide pre-made CSS classes and components to get that just right. Uh, so actually, while Electron does provide a native toolbar, because we wanted these stoplights in a particular place, we actually are rendering those too with CSS. Um, these buttons are all CSS buttons that are sort of set to the right size. Uh, but you can do little tricks like this doesn't have a one pixel border, it has a half pixel box shadow, which means that on retina displays, it displays as a true retina half pixel border, but on non-retina displays, it falls back to a regular border. Uh, and it's, it's nice to be able to use tricks like this because we're only supporting one environment. This is just... Chrome 50. If it works there, you're done. There's no cross-browser support with CSS, which means you can use Flexbox and a lot of the other latest pieces of CSS uh, without worrying about browser incompatibilities, uh, so, which, which actually makes CSS a very nice way to do these types of dynamic layouts. Uh, we actually can take it all the way to the point where the Windows version of the app is actually nothing much more but a different class on the body, uh, at which point all of the buttons are now your standard Windows buttons and making sure we get like the easing, the, the easing functions on the hover transitions just right to match the latest uh, Windows 10 specs as well. Uh, like I said, much of this uh, work has already been done by, uh, by the Electron community, so you don't need to necessarily stress over every single UI detail. Uh, but the flexibility to do so and really make it something that looks and feels and acts like a native app uh, is now there in this rich set of APIs. Um, another big one are things like right-click. Uh, if you want to see if it's not built on Electron, if you right-click the app, uh, you get options like back and reload, uh, which used to be the only thing you could do. Uh, if you're especially, like I said, for Windows users, Windows users really expect to click on email threads and do right-click actions from them. And being able to provide that through these very rich APIs that fall back to the native menu systems really helps pull all of these Electron apps across this uncanny valley and make it feel like a first-class native experience. Um, native is one piece about uh, what you can do, but the next big thing that everyone always asks about is performance. Uh, performance of a of this app, however, is actually very good because of the advancements of the web. Uh, your, first, uh, step, your first stop in performance is actually just regular uh, web-based jank busting. Uh, we have the Chrome dev tools as well here because this is Chrome and heavily use them to make sure that everything is running at 60 frames per second. Um, this, the fact that we do have all of the Chrome developer tools and everything that is in Chrome to make websites performant is frankly one of the reasons why I think this is a development platform that's worth 
uh, investing if anything just to get the tooling that's out here. These types of performance tools are actually extremely sophisticated. Uh, doing that on your own homegrown C++ app is a very, is a very daunting endeavor to say the least. I'm also really glad that <laughs> you heard the web workers talk early here too because you can furthermore enhance this with additional workers to put this off on other threads. Uh, but the nice thing about Electron is like I said, it gives you process control, which means you can do an additional trick and that is to load completely separate processes and completely separate windows, which, exactly, which is exactly what this is here. Uh, this is a window that we, that we needed to spawn that takes off a lot of the background processing tasks. When you sync down a gigabyte of mail data and parse JSON, it's really hard to do that on one thread. But here, this worker window, much like a web worker, can take off all of that processing um, and do it here, but we have the potential to also display DOM on top of it as well. Uh, this is UI and diagnosing on all of the requests that are going out, on the connections that we have, um, and being able to have that UI is really nice. Uh, actually, one of the reasons why React doesn't have a native homegrown web worker solution yet seems to be issues around things like text rendering, just because you need some amount of layout to really make sure that gets right. Um, but in Electron, you do have the capacity to load up these extra side pieces and parallelize a lot of that on a truly parallel process. Uh, the performance tooling and the workers are definitely something that keeps the app running smoothly. And if it's running at 60 frames per second, nobody really cares from a user's perspective what the underlying technology is. There is no reason to believe that web should be slow, especially with the advancements happening uh, in, like, in like threaded worker systems, hell, and web assembly, and like extra uh, and additional performance improvements that this community makes as well. Uh, the data side of things and the offline presence is another very powerful piece of Electron. Uh, because we have file system access, we can store all of our data in SQLite, actually. Um, so what we do is we've compiled uh, SQLite for each platform, and we ship it with the app. And because I have node access, uh, that means that I can, from anywhere, run a database query, uh, SQL select, and here I've grabbed 33,000 contact objects out of our local database. Uh, this is really important to making sure things work offline as well. Uh, all the data is locally available, we have this queue that makes sure that all of the tasks, even if the network drops or queued up, if you quit the app halfway through, those get serialized to disk. We can bring them back, restore them from disk, and keep running again. Having disk access means that you can uh, really keep these queues robust, and it means that the data is very easily accessible. Uh, it also means that we can do some pretty fun patterns, data patterns on top of uh, the database as well. Uh, we actually use a system where we take whole database queries uh, and use reactive X and observables to dump them straight into React components. So here I have a thread list full of, of a whole bunch of different thread items, and the way that I can grab that is with a SQL statement, uh, which leaves us with code that looks a little bit something like this. Uh, Rx observable is the observable library. And if you've never seen or used observables before, in this context, you can kind of think of it as a promise that runs that query, except it resolves every time and any time that query changes. It's a, constantly, it's a constant pipeline of events that come through, which means that anything that matches that query, regardless of how it got added or removed, causes a trigger, which causes us to reset the state on the component, um, and everything automatically updates. It means that we can declaratively wire components in the application straight to a database query uh, because of the access that we have directly to through the file system. Uh, the observable pattern is particularly nice because now that you think about it like a pipeline, you can subsequently then additionally filter and map on top of that as well. Um, it's a very powerful way to model uh, lots, lots of very large amounts of data in the application. Um, and as a result, because everything is backed by these, these data sources, because you can use SQL or whatever else you actually want to compile into there, 
you have a very robust, extremely available data set that you can use to power an application with. Uh, that backing of data and the fact that we can load things in and out of file system at runtime is also key to enabling a plugin model and make this very extensible. Uh, this is one of the primary reasons why we looked at Electron on our on the desktop in the first place. Actually, one of the reasons why Adam did as well. Adam wanted a, to be able to load in these third-party plugins and make a model that is built for extensibility. Uh, this is a very similar thing that we wanted to have in our email client as well. The, the core reason of why we built this in the first place was to make an email client that could support plugins and have its functionality extended. Uh, here I have what starts off as a basic email composer, uh, but I can go into our plugins and at runtime start loading all of these additional features from disk uh, to make a considerably richer uh, composer here. So by the time I've enabled all of these different pieces, I have a plugin that can uh, drop in templates and one that can add emoji um, and another one that can help me schedule a time to meet. That's a preview of the calendar coming. <laughs> um, and then subsequently then go off and send it later in an hour or so. Uh, these are all plugins that we can load from disk and can treat now these separate set of components as data uh, and hold them and inject them at runtime. Uh, and furthermore, we can put them in any of these regions that we've sort of set up around the application, which really lets all of these individual components drop in wherever they want in the application. Um, that type of plugin model would be very difficult to do if it was sort of just a website, if we, were, uh, if we didn't have that type of full control over the application that you have. Furthermore, just the concept of plugins is something that's much more familiar in a desktop environment, um, something people have seen, seen a lot and drastically, in our case, helps expand the functionality of what we can do with our application. Um, these are a lot of the, the sum of these pieces really makes this desktop environment a pretty unique place to develop with. Um, and it means that you, it's actually from, a, from, a, from my perspective, coding it at all in day after day uh, is really quite a joy. If anything, just for the not needing to worry about the extra browsers I need to support, um, but also just the, uh, the access to having all of these rich APIs at your fingertips means you can do a lot more things um, than, you, than you could before. Uh, all the work that we've done to sort of try and get a lot of this happening can all be found open source, uh, on open source, and one is on GitHub here. Uh, one of the reasons we uh, want to keep this open source is partly because we, we directly benefited from the Atom team and what the, the patterns that they use, so hopefully we can pass along <laughs> some of these electron patterns as well for others that want to also try and build some of these applications with the patterns I've talked about here today. Uh, finally, I want to mention, of course, this is a, a much larger team than uh, just myself that it took to put an app like this together, uh, but getting started was just, was just one and then two of us, so it's certainly something that can uh, get going easily. Um, so finally, I want to close by just sort of recapping about where we are today and hopefully where I see this, this going. Uh, today, you can start and download and run Electron pre-build, uh, loading your index.html, and you'll have your page on a desktop app. The, the Electron project is fairly new and growing, and over time, I definitely hope to see that more and more applications on the desktop are increasingly, will be built by this community as well. Um, it's certainly one that benefits from the creativity and the tooling of this ecosystem and something I hope to see improve continually into the future. Thank you very much. Good evening, and welcome back to JS Tonight. I'd like to welcome our first guest <laughs> to the couch, Mr. Evan Morikawa, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Evan. Well, hello. How's it going? Good. Welcome to the show. It's a good show. Uh, so I've seen you talk about uh, desktop, or JavaScript on the desktop a couple of times. Uh, it's a fascinating concept. It's really, really interesting. 
uh, in making the transition, because I'm assuming you worked on web before you worked on yes. desktop, uh, in making that transition, what was your favorite part about working on, on the desktop as opposed to the web? Yeah, so before working at Nihilus, uh, I was running a separate company building event ticketing software. It was all backbone, Rails app, uh, exercise left up to the reader view system, jQuery spaghetti all over the place, and we had to support IE8. Um, and all the mobile devices, because uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a mess. Uh, the, on a day-to-day -day basis, like really the fact that if I see something that looks cool and it runs in Chrome, we can just use it. Yeah, so um, it's, it's, a it's a pretty nice, if anything, playground, let alone production yeah. app environment. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so Electron's cross-platform, right? It so is. It, so it yep. sort of takes care of all those nitty-gritty details about going from Mac to Windows. Linux? Yep, yep. Linux as well. Fantastic. Uh, so one thing you talked about, um, or one thing sort of that caught my attention is you, it runs on Chrome. It runs on a Node version. So sort of as those projects uh, sort of update, uh, does that force you guys to push updates? Uh, what's the updating system like in, in Electron? Yeah, so Electron is Semverd, and it's when they bump a version, it's usually because, in part from bug fixes, that they upgraded the underlying Chrome and Node implementation. Uh, personally, I'm always both happy and hesitant to bump the version, because uh, <laughs> sure. actually Chrome, when they push new things, like very obscure things can break, but users, of course, blame you. They don't blame Chrome. Yeah. Um, so we definitely need to like QA those pieces as well. One of the best things about Electron is that it comes with a really nice auto-updater system. Nice. Uh, so people will see, like in our app, it's sort of the Spotify style, click this bar, your app gets updated. Um, and that now works on all the platforms. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, so Electron, uh, I, do you see this as sort of a blurring between sort of like uh, a user experience in a browser and a user experience on the desktop. Are we going to see a sort of increased play between those two things? Are they going to become the same thing? Like, where do you see this going? That's a that's a good question. Um, the <laughs> we've we've yet to see. I personally am very optimistic about this development environment. I think people like to think about things in terms of individual apps, like especially with with mobile things. I actually think that you will see. Um, I would argue that there has been a decline previously in native desktop looking applications. Mm. I actually think Electron and projects like this could uh, could very much turn that around. I think you could very you could start to see a lot of specialized apps um, yeah. because they're so much easier to build yeah. uh, for these environments. And until uh, and like there will always be a place for mobile, there will always be a place for for browser. But if you need like a keyboard and a monitor on like a Windows machine. Uh, there is still there is still very much that need even with uh, mobile connected world. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. For being on the show, <laughs> Evan Morikawa, ladies and gentlemen.